Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and welcome to the State Library of Queensland. Um, I'm Jane Cow, Director of Engagement and Partnerships, and it's a pleasure to host you here this evening at State Library. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and pay respects to the ancestors who came before them. The location of State Library on Kurupa Point was historically a significant meeting, gathering, sharing and trading place for Aboriginal people, and we proudly continue that tradition here today. I also uh, would like to acknowledge and welcome our speaker for tonight, Kim McCosker, owner and author of Four Ingredients Enterprises and somebody who's treated like a rock star to every library she's been to, which I'm sure uh, she will talk about. I'd also like to acknowledge and welcome Ray Weeks, chairman of the CEO Institute, members of the Library Board of Queensland, the Queensland Library Foundation, QUT Business School and the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame Governing Committee, and our very generous donors, who without them we could not do uh, what we do here with the uh, Business Hall of Fame, and that's our partners and donors, Crow Howarth, Channel 7, Logan City Council, Morgans, NAB and RACQ. We would particularly like to thank these donors and partners for their ongoing support of the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame. I'd also like to acknowledge and welcome our new state librarian who came late this evening, Vicki MacDonald, uh, who would have been up here, uh, but she had other things, but she did make it. I wanted to take this opportunity to also let you know about an important upcoming event for State Library on Saturday the 12th of November, where we will celebrate 10 years since the State Library took on its current award-winning design uh, and, and building. SLQ celebrates will be a day of discovery and festivity, featuring markets, music, food, creative activities, exhibition and tours, and you're all welcome uh, to come and enjoy that with us. Explore the Knowledge Walk featuring Bristol's 100% Queensland made craft markets, a wide selection of food stalls as well as live music, poetry readings and storytelling sessions. Uh, pick up a book for a gold coin donation at our Great Book Swap, which raises funds for the Indigenous literacy in partnership with the Children's Book Council. Uh, we have tours and you can discover unique back of house features of State Library, which you wouldn't normally see on the day as well. Please look at our State Library website on slq.qld.gov.au and we would be delighted if you could join us as this new building enabled us to be a much uh, more engagement and uh, experience type library uh, than we were before 2006. And now I'd like to invite Peter Little, Deputy Vice-Chancellor at QT and fellow member of the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame Governing Committee, who will be your MC for this evening's event. Uh, thanks very much, Jane, and welcome to you all uh, to uh, tonight's Game Changer uh, series event. Um, I'd especially like to welcome also our, our live stream viewers. Um, I know we've got dedicated followers uh, in Melbourne uh, and throughout Queensland and other places, so welcome to you all. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, tonight for the final Game Changers event of 2016, which um, I'm absolutely uh, certain will be uh, an exceptional conversation. The series uh, is designed to bring innovative leaders from business, technology and creative industries to share their insights with us. We, we only invite genuine game changers. It's a rare platform enabling Queensland's game changers in business to share their pathways to success and some of their battles and triumphs along the way. Game Changers is a Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame initiative. Established in 2009 by the State Library of Queensland, the Queensland Library Foundation and the QT Business School, the Hall of Fame is focused on celebrating, recording and retelling stories of Queensland's outstanding business leaders and their mo many contributions to the development of this state. This year, the Hall of Fame saw six Queensland businesses and individuals inducted into the Hall of Fame. We'd like to play a short video to introduce you to the 2016 inductees. On Thursday, July 28th, six outstanding Queenslanders were inducted into the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame. 
These distinguished business leaders were recognised for their significant contribution to the economic and social development of our state. Their remarkable stories can be viewed online by accessing the Queensland Business Leaders Hall of Fame website or by visiting the dedicated space in the John Oxley Library in the State Library of Queensland. Don't miss those stories, they're inspiring and uh, if you don't know Samuel Hornibrook, well he built over 100 bridges, all of our iconic bridges and the sales and most of the Sydney Opera House which many people don't know. So we encourage you to explore uh, those stories and others uh, on the uh, Hall of Fame website which is hallofame.slq.qld.gov.au. Our Game Changer series here at the State Library this year has been has seen fascinating uh, conversations with business leaders. Jamie Ferris, uh, Founder and Managing Director of the very successful Corporate Travel Management. Bruce Wolfe, Managing Director of the iconic business Conrad Gargat. And James Chin Moody, Co-Founder and CEO uh, of Sendal. Uh, it was a wonderful, uh, wonderful interview and if you haven't seen it, don't miss it. Tonight, uh, we welcome another outstanding business leader, Kim McCosker, uh, owner and author for Ingredients Enterprises, and we're really looking forward to hearing her remarkable story. We encourage our live stream viewers to tweet your questions as we go using the hashtag QBLHOF. Similarly, uh, for those in the audience with burning questions, please feel free to tweet the questions or hold them for the Q&A session. Ray and, uh, and Kim will address as many of those questions as possible uh, according to time. Uh, and we do ask you to keep your mobiles uh, switched to silent for the du duration uh, of the session. I'd now like to welcome uh, our in interviewer tonight, Ray Weeks, to the stage to introduce Kim and begin tonight's conversation. Thank you. <coughs> That's good. Well, good evening and uh, welcome to our final Game Changers event for uh, this year. As you know, this Game Changers series is about bringing internationally recognised entrepreneurs and innovative business leaders to tell their stories and, as Peter said, to share their insights, but also to describe their remarkable growth achievements. Now, tonight you're going to hear a classic tale of true entrepreneurial spirit, of persistence, resilience, it is a great story of courage and self-belief and what you'll understand is this remarkable stamina and passion that Kim McCosker has. Kim McCosker created, as most of you know, the most successful book title in Australia, Four Ingredients, placing second in overall sales to, uh, to uh, J.K. Rowling's uh, Harry Potter. It has gone on to reach a total sales mark of over 2.5 million copies spanning over three continents, 26 countries, and it's in six languages. And Kim McCosker is the highest self-published author in Australian history. Now, the book, which we'll explore tonight, was turned down by a number of major publishers who are ruining their decisions. The Four Ingredients Phenomenon has taken digital media to significant levels with one of the fastest growing Australian-based Facebook pages with over 700,000 fans. So the Four Ingredients television series is now broadcast in uh, 24 countries. So please welcome this publishing phenomenon, Kim McCosker. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for having me. I'm uh, delighted to think that you think I'm remarkable enough to grace the stage. So <laughs> it was a very nice introduction. I'm glad you read what I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank Just you. joking. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, Kim, you, you defied all logic by writing a cookbook that the experts said would never work. You were knocked back, as I said, by the major publishers. You self-funded your project with a mortgage on your house. You sold the books door to door. And you've now got what the trade refers to as the tsunami of all cookbooks. Australia's most successful self-published cookbook series ever. Let's hear how Four Ingredients came about. 
Oh, well, four ingredients came about uh, at a period in my life um, when I was in finance. I actually did a degree, what most people don't realise, I actually did a degree in international finance. Mm. And um, like most entrepreneurs or many that I have met, often their idea stems from a personal need that they've had through their own experience, their own life. So I was at a period in my life uh, in corporate finance. I worked for a very esteemed company that I am glad to see as a sponsor here tonight, mm. NAB. Hello, NAB. <laughs> and um, thank you for your continued support of such an amazing event. And um, it was a bit of a pressure cooker. It was, um, you know, quite stressful, long hours. Our head office was here, but headquarters was uh, Docklands, Melbourne, so I'd mm. often fly back. Mm. I'd, you know, battle peak hour traffic, I pick the children up from after school care, we get home, no one's walked the dog, no one's watered the plants, I've got to get a load of washing on, everyone's starving, what's for dinner mum? So into the pantry I go with my beautiful array of cookbooks because we all have them, we all have to eat and oh this one looks semi-inspirational so I'd get it out, I'd open it up, I'd scan the list of ingredients required for the dinner and Jesus, Mary and Joseph above, there's 16 ingredients and one's a spatchcock. <laughs> 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 and it was 10 past 6 on a Wednesday evening. So, you know, that's not my rush hour, that's my crush hour. You know, teach me how to make a sour cream quiche with ingredients I already have in my cupboard. Show me how to put together a quick, easy, delicious, nutritious stir fry with things I've already got in my fridge or pantry. So on maternity leave with my second child, I sat down one day, I opened up my laptop to a Word document, it was a blank page, and I started to write what I called the easiest cookbook, ever known to mankind, mm. which eventually mm. morphed into four ingredients. So the, the, uh, the idea of four ingredients is, is simple, but as you said, incredibly practical for people from all walks of life. Now, it seems, so you had this idea before bringing it to market. Just take us through the key drivers of this product, this great product, both from a business and a lifestyle perspective. So take us a little further on the, on the ladder as well. Well, if there's a word that I could use to summarise four ingredients mm. in mm. many aspects, mm. um, it would be easy. The whole concept of four ingredients is that it's just easy. Every recipe can be made with just four or fewer mm. ingredients. Mm. There was a fruitcake out there. Did anyone actually see the fruitcake in the foyer? Okay, how many ingredients do you think would be in that fruitcake? Oh, three. <laughs> Did you overhear the conversation? Ah, so there, usually an enthusiastic audience member would say four and I'd go, oh, you're so clever. And then they'd <laughs> smile with their chest and then I'd go, but you're wrong. And then they deflate. There's only three. So, you know, everything I make is easy. It's the easiest cupcake. It's the mm. easiest fruit cake. It's the easiest chicken pie. So there was that element. It had to be easy. So four mm. or fewer ingredients. I knew you could cook successfully with four ingredients mm. because mm. when I moved out of home, uh, moved into my own lodgings, you know, went to university, I'd always ring my mum, mum, how do you do your apricot chicken? Oh, sweetie, it's really simple. You just need some chicken, some onion, some apricot nectar and some French onion soup. Mm. Mum, how do you do your scones? Oh, so simple. You just need some self-raising flour, lemonade and cream. And I'm going, oh my gosh, this is all so easy. Flo Bjorki Peterson's recipe needs eight ingredients and I've got to mash and, you know, boil and mash pumpkin. Mm. So there was that as well. The ingredients had to be accessible. So I grew up in a very small country town that had one supermarket called IGA, mm -hmm. Mandubra IGA. And if you couldn't buy the ingredient on the shelves at the Mandubra IGA, it didn't make it into print. So there was that. Uh, it was just, <laughs> it was very, it was, it was just easy. And that was the criteria, the basis. And then I got to the method and I went, right. The method for every recipe has to be explained in, on average, only four sentences. So really, that was easy too. So the whole concept was to help my uncomplicate my busy mm -hmm. life sure. at that period of the day mm -hmm. where the wheels are falling off the bus. So you're the highest selling, self-published author in Australian history. Now take us through some of the perils and the advantages of self-publishing versus uh, a mainstream book deal. Just give, us the, just give us the comparative. Uh, well, 
it's devastating when you have worked. It's like mm. when you write something, when you create something from a blank. Remember I mm. said you open up and there's the blank Word document and you create this thing that is 140 pages. And there is not a word that hasn't been underlined, italics, mm. bolded, emphasised. There is not a, a paragraph, a sentence that hasn't had a little bit of you involved in it. So when you have this amazing baby, it was like I'd given birth to another child. Mm. When you go to a publisher and you, are, in all your enthusiasm, are telling them about this fabulous product you've worked on and how it's going to revolutionise the homes of Australia and beyond that they don't want to know you. You know, the conversation with the publishers when I had this manuscript was, was something along the lines of, Ray, you know, hi, my name's Kim McCoskin. I've written this manuscript. It's going to help everybody. It's just so easy. It's just everything you've made with four ingredients. You're going to love it. And they would say to me, are you famous? And i go, oh, evidently she did not hear what I just told her. You know, but the, the, the question was rhetoric. Mm -hmm. It was repetitive. Mm -hmm. And what I soon realised that was without fame, you have no following. Mm -hmm. And without a following, you're never going to get a publishing deal. So it became very evident very early on that we weren't going to get a publishing deal and that we had to go down the route of self-publishing. Mm -hmm. And it took me two seconds uh, researching on Google to realise that to self-publish, you must also self-fund. Mm -hmm. So one night, ladies... I slipped into something not quite so comfortable after I put the children to bed and locked their door, poured two very large glasses of red wine, made my husband's favourite meal and looked him in the eyes and said to him, Glenn, God, you're handsome. I love you. <laughs> I love you so much and could I have $26,000, please? Because remember, I too have a finance background, so in my mind, I'm sitting there going to gross 20, to, to pull 26 k out of our family's mortgage. I've had to gross, because of tax in this beautiful country we live in, I've had to gross nearly $38,000. Mm. You know, so I'm going, I'm asking my husband for $38,000 to fund a cookbook that the whole trade has said will never sell. So it's not looking so good at the moment. So I strategically had to position the situation to get the outcome that I so wanted. So God bless him. He said, after I resuscitated him, um, yeah, he said, here you go. And then, you know, it was what I learned is that it's not the product, mm. it's not the service. That's actually the easy part. As much bled, blood, sweat and tears went into writing that beautiful manuscript. We cooked over a, a thousand recipes to whittle it down to the 300 that made it into the first book. You know, um, thousands of dollars, thousands of hours. I put on four kilos. There was all this stuff. And then, you know, that's the easy part. Mm. Then what you've got to realise is you know, well, how are we going to sell this? Mm. How are we going to tell the world, Australia, that this book is going to help them infinitely save time and money if they start to use it? And so, so I realised marketing. Yeah, exactly. So take us through your promotional strategy, your, your brand strategy, and take us through why your personal brand, Kim McCosker, is so important to the success of these books. But take us through your brand strategy first. Probably the word that underlines, just like four ingredients is easy, the word that, you know, underlines me is passion. Mm. You know, I'm very passionate mm. about what I do. Mm. Um, I'm very blessed to, have, uh, to be passionate and after a decade of doing what I do, to still have that passion mm. because even in the most t tumultuous of days, the days where you've just got an overwhelming amount of work in front of you, um, it just doesn't feel like passion or like hard work when you've got that passion because it just drives you, doesn't it? You get excited about things when you're passionate about it. You just, and you end up creating more work for yourself because, you know, in the pursuit of perfection or the best possible outcome in terms of a book, you know, it's the passion that drives you to, to study every line, to look at every angle, to, to make it the best it possibly can be so that when you do get it in your home and you do open it up and you do use it, it's something that resonates with you. Because if it resonates with you, what are you going to do? You're going to tell your neighbour. You're going to tell the mum on the, on the school run. And that is, you know, word of mouth is the most powerful marketing strategy that there is. But look, early on, I just upskilled in the art of marketing. You know, and I'd come from a finance background. You know, what do we do? Actually, you know, there is not a job on the face of the planet that is not in sales. Even a neurosurgeon's in sales. Everyone's in sales, whether you like it or not. We are all in sales. So it's just how you, you know, how you sell. Your customers. Yeah. And I'm not a hard sell. I never have been. I'm interested in, 
understanding what your problem is and finding something that solves it. That's all I do. Mm. That's all I do. I just initially started with my problem and wrote something I wanted to solve. But like back in the day, oh my God, we might need another, more, more than an hour. But back in the day, <laughs> when we started, I had a map of Australia on my office wall. Mm. And I would say, I would take Queensland today and then I would ring every big W store. And then I would ring every Angus and Robinson store, then every Dimmick store. And in the first round of phone calls, I would be Chantel. Hello, my name's Chantel. And I'm ringing because I've heard of this amazing cookbook called Four Ingredients. All the mothers on the school run are talking about it. And I'd like four copies. And they'd go, oh, no, never heard of it. What? <laughs> oh, my goodness me. Well, I'm going to ring, if that was Big W, I'm going to ring Target. Well, hang on a second and we'll look and, you know. So I, <laughs> and then one day my mother walked in and she goes, Chantel? And I said, yes, but it's working. This is my strategy. So then my mum got on the phone and she goes, her name's Jeanette, but she gets on the phone and goes, well, hello, my name's Joan. And I'm ringing too. And so Just we would do... We were building, yeah. 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 And then I would ring back four days later and I'd actually introduce myself as Kim and very seldom did you speak to the, you know, the same person. Sometimes you did. Yeah. But I would ring back my, as, as me and I would thank them in advance for any help that they could give a poor self-published author, you know, um, in a sea of, like, the cookbook genre is incredibly yeah. dense. It's very, yeah. very difficult to break through. And this is, we're talking... <laughs> March 2007 when, you know, we had uh, Nigella and Jamie and Gordon with these massive marketing machines, with these massive mm. recipe books, massive ingredients. So with your marketing strategy, you've taken it onto the digital platform. You've now got the most remarkable exposure through various social media. Take us through that and how you've... And take us through the marketing strategy through the, the digital approach. Well, that marketing, strat that's more direct face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. So when then the book started to take off, yep. as it did, mm -hmm. you would get inquiries from people in Kalgoorlie or from Cairns, mm -hmm. and then it started to happen internationally in Dublin. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, I wanted to be able to help these people. I wanted really Mary from County Cork. I wanted her scones to rise. So um, I realised, though, that we needed a platform to be able to document that. And although uh, email is good, only one person sees that. So very, very early on, uh, I become an early adopter of all things Facebook. So this was probably about 2008, um, you know, when I, I knew a handful of people. I mean, remember, Facebook only started at Harvard in 2004. So we were on, you know, we were on the Sunshine Coast in 2008. It's not a huge stretch of time in between. So, yeah, we sort of really started because why I like Facebook is an immediate dialogue, not just with two people, but with many. And you could also, it can be visual. So I could walk Mary through, well, this is what the dough looks like. This is how you roll it. This is how you cut it. I'm just photographing it on my phone and uploading it. It's all taking me literally seconds to do. Mm. And then Mary was so thankful. She was like, oh, my goodness. So Mary has then become, uh, you know, unbeknownst to her, a brand ambassador mm. for me and my product. And Twitter's big, big for you, isn't it? Twitter is not as big as Facebook. Um, Instagram would be my second, second. in terms okay. of following because, right. again, it's very visual. Mm -hmm. um, we don't use, tend to use Twitter so much. We use Twitter so much if we have a quick message. Okay. See you at 6 o'clock tonight at SLQ. <laughs> Mm. Hashtag game changes. Mm. You know, but if I want to actually show a, a, a picture of my cake, I don't use Twitter so much. But mm. all digital has been an integral part and still is now mm. uh, of mm. my marketing strategy. So we have two forms. We have the traditional and then we have the digital. Mm. Social media. Good. Yeah. Good. Now, look, after this success of your um, <coughs> excuse me, self-published books, you've been offered some great deals by the, uh, by the major publishers. Mm. Now, based on your... your your background, what did you say to them? Well, by the time the deal started to come, so mm. we launched uh, 17 March 2007. By mm. Christmas, the end of that year, the first book had sold roughly around about 800,000 copies, which was phenomenal, huge, uh, amazing volume. Mm. Uh, a good book sells on average in Australia maybe 5,000 mm. copies a year, if it is lucky. And the publisher works extraordinarily hard with the author to mm. ensure mm. that outcome. Mm. So we've defied logic on all several, several mm. layers. 
But, you know, by then, you know, with a finance background, I've got the pie chart and I know how much it is to print. I know how much it is to freight. I know how much it is to house. Mm. I know how much it is to market and to distribute. And then there's this leftover. And then the publisher comes along with his crate of moe, which was gladly received. <laughs> uh, uh, and his pie chart, the portion for me, looked significantly different. So by that time, I wasn't looking for, I wasn't in the market for a traditional publishing deal. So I, mm. I was mm. just up front with them. Mm. I won't waste your time. Don't waste my time. We need, you need to, to, to outside, you need to think outside the box. There mm. needs to be a joint venture. There needs to be something different than a mainstream publishing deal because we're beyond that now because mm. we know too much about how it works. We had good contacts. The people that I've printed with back in 2007 are still the people that I've printed with. In fact, I was just with our English, uh, our, um, uh, Chinese printers, mm. so I have two printers. I have an international, so we'll mm. print international when we go across three continents and we'll print domestically when we're going across one. We try to do as much in Australia as we possibly can, but sometimes to freight from Australia to England. Mm. Now, just on your support for your, your growth strategy, we'll come back to your growth strategy in a second. Simon & Schuster, mm. US. Mm. Just explain that move. So... Um, I had, an, I had a view because uh, online th we started getting inquiries internationally. Can we get mm. your book here? Can we get mm. your book here? And because Australia is such a very small little country, you start to get publishing inquiries internationally too when you're selling the volume that we sell here. Mm. Um, but I didn't know which way to go. So I actually tended my business, not for publishing in Australia, but for publishing internationally. So I went to uh, Random House and Penguin, they were independent, or oh, they combined now, but they were both two businesses back then. Simon and Schuster, a number of the big boys in Sydney, and I said, this is what we want to do. We want to actually take the um, English rights to America, to England, etc. And it was Simon and Schuster Australia that uh, their deal resonated best with me. Mm. So I had to join them in a joint venture. We had to, I had to commit to a four book deal with them over a number of years, but they would then allow me to leverage my backlist of titles into, and they would endorse and help me, the UK and then the big fish, mm. uh, Simon & Schuster mm. USA. Mm. USA. See, mm. Simon & Schuster USA is owned by CBS. Mm. Mega, Massive, mega, mega, mega company, right. billion dollar company. Mm. And I mean, they might get upward of 10,000 unsolicited manuscripts or solic uh, solicited unsolicited manuscripts a year. Mm. Like, you know, mm. Ten thousands and thousands a year, they will publish 100. Mm. They will publish probably even less than that, and especially if you're a foreign, you know, a foreigner. So the chance of getting a deal with them is very, very, very slim. But you know, fortunately enough, it was around about 2011. I signed a seven-book deal with uh, Simon and Schuster America or CBS America, mm. which was just extraordinary. So we negotiated an exceptional advance at a time when our dollar was at about a dollar ten. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't hurt a time in that day. So you know, it was just yeah. It was lots of things have happened, but you know. As, as, as much as we celebrated, Mel, didn't we, that success, like that was a core, that was a goal that we had, that mm. was a mm. huge successful moment for us. Mm. It also pre pre presented an enormous amount of challenges because in America, like I had to actually be screen tested to go on Good Morning you know, in Australia, like anyone, or yeah. they'll take anyone on Channel 9's Good Morning, <laughs> <laughs> Sunrise, you've got a pulse, right, you're next. <laughs> Whereas in America, I actually had to be screen tested to determine whether or not I needed your subtitles. <laughs> really? So it was just this big rigmarole and, you know, you were in the green room with Mark Burnett. Mm. So, you know, um, Survivor? The brainchild's behind, like this guy, he is huge in the States, massive, more in the religious stream of, of, of TV over there than sure. the mainstream. But, you know, and, and so you're on TV here for four minutes of a morning and you will get sales probably that last around about six weeks. Mm. That's how powerful TV is, mm. uh, especially prime time, like a current affair in Australia. Over there, you're on TV for four, three to four minutes and that's all your sales is. That's it, because guess who's coming on after you? Mariah Carey with her best off. 
<laughs> LeBron James just signed a $67 million deal with the you know, Cavaliers. Like, it's extraordinary the level mm. of talent mm, that they have over there. And you mm. are just... So, you know, and we used to think, right, we need to blanket America, didn't we, Mel? We went, that's what we did in Australia. We blanketed Australia. We'll blanket America. We'll go on the morning TVs. We're, oh, my gosh, it'll... But it wasn't to be. And then you realise that Greater Chicago has a population the same as Australia. Of course, yeah. And so you realise then that you can actually hone, you know, mm. you can look at, you know, the... Mi- yeah, the market segments. The right. market yeah. segments and mm. you can actually... So, mm. you know, this is all things we've learnt and it's a big challenge doing business, you know, with geography as a barrier. Let's talk about you. Just come back to you and your family and how your family shaped you. You came off the land. Mm. There's a range of values that you're showing everyone here tonight. Tell us about your values and how... They've been shaped by your, uh, your background, coming off the property. So, um, yes, I grew up in a very small country town called Mundubra. Has anyone heard of Mundubra? Oh! So, Mundubra is two hours west of Vandenberg, huge citrus belt, and we wanted for nothing growing up, mm. but we had to work for everything. And I'm not just talking, go clean the car and make your bed and vacuum the floor. I'm talking eight hours in a hot field, mm. you know, thinning murkot trees. Murkots are a variety of orange that have thorns about that length. So my brothers and I would come home at night and we would sit there having dinner going, how many scars have you got? How many scars have you got? So, you know, we have, my brothers and I, huge work ethics, massive work ethics. You know, when I was a backpacker overseas, I'd just go and get three jobs. I found making money Earning, no, sorry, I found earning money easy mm. because I have such a strong work ethic. Mm. I just go and get three or four jobs when I was a backpacker in London. What I, what I didn't know what to do, in fact, I, I found I had a really good skill in that period of my life. I found that I was very, very good at spending money. I was excellent. <laughs> and I knew I could earn it, so I could earn it and spend it. What I didn't yeah. know is how I could earn it, invest it and, and grow it. And that's what I came back uh, from my backpacking days and I went back to university and studied a degree in finance to learn and that has probably been a core reason long term for the success Mm. of uh, Four Ingredients because as much as it's important to have a great accountant, a great bookkeeper, a great solicitor, no one looks after your finance, a fabulous banker, no one looks after your finances better than you. You must upskill in finance as much as marketing. We were talking about this earlier too, just the grounding you get. With, with your finance background, mm. it holds you in such great stead, doesn't it, in any uh, area of uh, commercial activity. Oh. And, you know, like, we will have pre and a financial year meetings with my accountant and she's saying we predict your tax to be this. And I'm going, get back in there and come back out with a different prediction. <laughs> 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 Who do we need to talk to? What do we need to do? You know, so you must challenge the people in your life. When you don't like the result of something, you must challenge mm-hmm. them. Mm-hmm. Because guess what? They will rise to the occasion and they will look. My bankers, you know... Money is cheap at the moment, beautiful people. If you were borrowing to borrow, you know, for a home or an investment property, mm. you know, don't be paying anything more than 4%. And if your home loan's above 4%, you need to be talking to these people in the third row here to get it below 4%. Money is cheap. So sometimes we get really complacent, you know, with our finances, etc. Mm. So it's good mm. to have these amazing people, but it's really important to be, you know, on top of it yourself and to challenge but people have to understand, you've you got such a strong finance background. You mentioned this degree in international finance. Yeah, I know. I was you mentioned the, uh, the fact that you were with your estate manager yeah. for MLC Private Client Services. You transitioned that unit to NAB Wealth Management. I mean, these are major finance roles. Yeah. And that's uh, yet... <laughs> I know. How did that happen? You and then I wrote a cookbook. <laughs> how did that happen? You give accountants a great well, name. Well, now I've become a publishing house. Like, how did that happen? <laughs> exactly. You know, exactly. but it's just all, I don't know, sometimes life, there's no logic to life. It just mm. leads you. But, and honestly, if someone had said to me 10 years ago, this is the path you'll have to be, to be sitting here at, you know, SLQ, talking to the esteemed Ray Weeks uh, at Game Changers, but these are all the things in between that you'll have to have done, mm. I would have went, oh my God, I'm exhausted looking at that. You know, sometimes a good dose of naivety or not knowing what's in the future serves you best. And that's one of the ingredients for good entrepreneurship. You At never times, know what's around the, the corner, gift do you? Of, the gift of doubt. Yeah, the gift Not of really doubt. truly but understanding. You know and equally, 
the gift of self-belief. Yes, absolutely. Because it's self-belief that allows you to see opportunity. That's it. You know? Now here we are with Kim Akoska, we're talking about energy, passion, self-belief, persistence, resilience. If I asked, but it, if I asked say, Melinda or your team members to tell me about you, what would they say? She's so lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy to work for her. <laughs> Well, Mel, I met on the school run, everyone. This is Mel, second um, sitting... Yeah, this is Mel. <laughs> Mel is sweeter than maple syrup. So when I needed someone to front my business in customer service, to be that first person, that first point of contact, um, I looked for someone on... I hire for personality, because in my mm. business, mm. all other skills can be taught. You cannot teach someone um, to be nice, to be patient, to genuinely care, to be mm. empathetic. Mm. You know, you can't teach that. You either have yeah. that or not. Mel goes on holidays, and then my husband answers the phone, and, you know, someone's cake's drooping in the middle, and he's like, for God's sake, there is a war happening in Afghanistan, and your cake drooped in the middle? <laughs> you know, we haven't won a friend there. Whereas... <laughs> <laughs> Whereas Mel has not only unearthed why the cake sank, but she's upsold another four books that, you know, it's just, it's amazing. Yeah. So, you know, I would hope that Mel would say, I lead by example, I'm a strong, fortuitous character, mm. I'm honest, um, I treat people the way I want to be treated, I'm mm. generous, you know, the successes that we've had in our business I've shared with my girls, my goodness me, there's four of us the core, mm. and then there's my research and development team who are, you know, permanent part-time, four over here. But the core of us each have defined roles, each know what each does beautifully. We've travelled the world, we've cooked for parliament houses, we've filleted fish in, you know, uh, in, in Auckland, we've, mm. you know, sailed on the Hudson with royalty. It's been an... Ex we are connected for life. Mm. This journey, we are connected for so life. So for those people that work for you, the values, behaviours, you've... You've summed it up, have you? What you look for in people who work for you, like Mel and others? Yeah, yeah. I hire for pers I've hired for personality. Okay. Yeah, you'll meet me and my three girl the, th the three girls that are full time in my family uh, in my oh well they are my family, mm. but yeah we are very very similar and mm. we just have four ingredients coursing through our veins. Mm. None of you are going to get out of here tonight without buying a book. It just won't happen. <laughs> You'll join us on Facebook, you know, we'll talk about a chicken pie, you know, it'll be the easiest ever. And it just happens. Like, we stopped because on the way down here, my car is splashing tyre pressure low and I've gone, oh, gosh, you know, we're not even at Burp and Gary, don't break down here. So we, we went in, we asked this lovely man to help us with the tyre and I said, well, Mel, I'll do this with this lovely man from Lynn Fox and you go in and buy coffees. She's come out and she said, oh, just got to take back in a business car because I sold a copy of you know, healthy <laughs> diet. <laughs> and it's just naturally how we all work. You yeah. know, we are innovative. Every person yeah. we talk to, we're, we're waiting to learn something from you. We, we're just super friendly. You know, we've just come off um, five days in Frankfurt. We're four days from going to Singapore. But in Frankfurt, I'm cooking on stage. My German is Guten Morgen. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you know, but I had the most popular cooking demonstrations because it was simple, it was easy. I bought $200 worth of little um, koala bears. I threw them out into the audience for everyone who even just nodded. I went, oh, my God, they're participating. Let's throw them a koala. Tell me about the size of the Frankfurt Book Fair. So the, the Frankfurt Book Fair... Yeah. Um, the Frankfurt Book Fair is the oldest, biggest, largest fair in the mm. world. Mm. Um, it's got a very rich, you know, Frank, well, mm. Frankfurt, mm. There's, near Frankfurt, there's a city called Mines, and it in, invented the, the printing press back in the 13th. Yeah. yeah, Gutenberg. There's mm. a museum there that we went to. Mm. So, you know, uh, printing, paper, publishing, mm. huge there. Mm. So Frankfurt Book Fair happens every year in October. There are 400,000 people that pass through this fair in five days. There are 7,300 exhibitors, of which we will won. And you ask yourself, mm. how are we going to stand out? But you know what? what? It was like that very first um, cookbook I wrote. Has anyone actually got a copy of that book? It's like got a green cover with a red four on it. So totally ugly. The ugliest cookbook. <laughs> You are ever going to own, you know, in your life. But do you know what made us decide on that colour scheme? 
I walked into Dimmick's in Chermside, which actually is still there, mm. and I went to the cookbook. So cookbooks and travel dense, huge genres. And I walked up and down and I studied every book on that shelf. And there were cafe latte and colour, pale aubergine, sky blue, daffodil yellow. And I went, oh, Kermit the Frog Green. It is going to stand out. It is going to be. Set, it's going to set itself apart from everything mm. else, mm. and that's what it did. So that's what we tried to do in Germany as well. Good, you know, we good. spend our time strategizing how we're going to stand out. So look, talk about your own leadership. Talk about what, what other personal attributes do you think of a, of a great leader? Leaders that you maybe have been inspired by, just that you've been impressed by, whatever. What are some of the big attributes of a, an effective leader? Uh, an effective leader doesn't take no for an answer. It's a bit like your husband, girls, really, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Persistence always pays off, always gets his own way at the end of it. But, you know, you just don't take no only means no today. Mm. You know, uh, we battled for, oh, my gosh, months to get on Channel 7 on Sunrise mm. when we first mm. launched Four Ingredients. Right. And honestly, I thought they were going to take a DVO <laughs> out against us. Oh, my God. And then one day, the person that we always spoke to, John, let's say his name's John mm. Fictitional, he was sick. And I'm going, oh, goodness me, yay. Oh, he's sick. <laughs> and we got Tom. Unbeknownst to me, Tom had just been divorced. And all of a sudden, every second week, Tom's cooking for his kids that he'd never cooked for before and was absolutely, you know, the home dad was stressing him out more than anything. He goes, four ingredients. Oh, my God, this is music to my ears. Yes, come on in. And he invited us in on the public holiday it was Queen's uh, birthday long weekend in June, and that was the morning we were on. So we've elevated eyeballs on... The morning <laughs> shows average around 300 uh, sets well, of eyeballs every yep, morning. Yep. On a public holiday in June, which is cold, you're nearly doubling that. Mm. So our brand in Australia, so we remember launched in March, this is June, went from this stratosphere to that stratosphere mm. overnight. It was extraordinary. But that happened because we did not take no for an mm. answer. Mm. You continue to chip away until you get to where you want. You know, I wanted to write the easiest diabetes cookbook ever. Not because I have diabetes. Thankfully, this autoimmune disease is not mine. But because it is regularly asked. Mm. I have a great dialogue with my audience. And if you ask them, they'll tell you what they want. Mm. And if you write the best that you can mm. with people, a governing body that will endorse it, it not only opens it up to your family, but to their family. Do you know what the database is of Diabetes Australia? Diabe there are 286 people diagnosed daily with diabetes in Australia. Mm. Diabetes Australia database is 5.5 million people. Yeah. What is that for us? That's a market. Mm. I'm not writing a diabetes book without their endorsement. I mm. rang them, what, nine months, Mel, ten months? I was almost in tears some days. And eventually I said to this poor lady, you do not understand that I am not going away. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to continue to call you. And she put me through to somebody who could actually help me. And mm. then now, you know, it's been the biggest selling diabetes cookbook 2015, 2016 to date this year. Mm. Um, and they want to write more. But I didn't take no for an that's answer. Good. So a that's key, one That's one of key many. ingredient. Yeah. So what do you know about yourself now? that you may not have known about yourself in the early days. But you understand, the, uh, the, again, the strength of character, the self-belief and so on that you exude. But what do you know about yourself now that you uh, didn't know about yourself in those early days? I, I write a good book. Yeah? Yeah, That's I never it. knew. I did a degree in finance. Numbers generally are what influenced my decision mm. to write mm. a book. People mm. say to me, why did you write a book called Cook for a Cure? Cook for a Cure is a book that I wrote to raise awareness and funds for breast cancer, mm. for the National mm. Breast Cancer Foundation. Now, I wrote that because I learned one in eight women in Australia will be diagnosed mm. with breast cancer. So I look at these two rows here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One of you girls will be diagnosed with breast cancer. Now, I find that alarming. Mm. 
I find that disturbing. Mm. So based on those numbers, I wrote a cookbook to help raise funds. Mm. You know, uh, gluten-free, I've written a cookbook, the biggest selling cookbook, um, you know, in the gluten-free genre, 2014, 15, and also to date, 16, God bless, continues. But not because I have a, am a celiac or have a gluten mm. intolerance, but because there is a demand. Because one in a hundred Australians will be uh, will be diagnosed with celiac disease. Mm. One in ten with a gluten intolerance. But yep. the experts in the trade uh, reckon it's closer to one in four. But many go undiagnosed. You know, just live with the symptoms. Mm. So you know, those numbers are extraordinary. Now, but with these successes, with these great achievements, is there anything you know about yourself now that has surprised you? I have stamina. Mm. I have stamina beyond what I ever thought. Mm. You know, I liken to going into business for yourself as starting on an ultra marathon. Mm. You know, that is what mm. business, being self-employed <clears throat> is, that is what I liken it to. And you need strength and you need stamina and you need tenaciousness. Mm. And underpinning all of those, you will work hard and you will only do that if you maintain your passion. So what's your central purpose now? What's your... What's your burning desire from here? Well, now it's just, you know, we have a solid foundation domestically. Mm. But, you know, there's a gentleman in the uh, room. I don't know where he is. Neil. You know, I'm working with Neil at the moment, uh, who's an amazing uh, and internationally renowned, um, you know, design uh, artist. You know, he's, he's extraordinary with what he's done. He's worked with, you know, Sunbeam and all these crazy, uh, phenomenally mm. successful international companies. And we're going to design something together that's going to blow your mind away. Mm. Like, mm. who knew that? Mm. I met him at the Umundi pub, for God's sake. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where he is. But, you know, you need to find him and you need to get his business cut because what he has worked on, you will bl it will blow your mind. He, he did the, the Rover lawnmower. Was it L Rover? Oh, there he's up the back somewhere. I hear the voice. You know, so when you stay open to opportunity, but this mm. is where mm. self-belief, you know, now mm. if I could bottle self-belief, mm. I would give it to every child born with a mm. pulse. You know, it is such a great gift. I said to my mum, how did you give it to us? You know, but if, you, you know, with self-belief comes confidence. With com confidence, you know, comes ideas. With ideas comes creativity, you know, mm -hmm. and that's how it all, a lot of the things I'm working on now, domestically and internationally, mm. are an extension of the solid foundation I have mm. here. And it's mm. really exciting. It's extraordinary what mm. we've got. I don't even think, right, after 28 titles, after apps, after the phenomenal income that we get from endorsements, from TV, from radios, all of that, I don't even think we've scratched the surface of where four ingredients mm. will, will end up. Mm. That's the exciting part. Mm. And that's just, you know, that's invigorating to be a part of. That's exciting to be a part of. And the wonderful thing is now, because so many have been on the journey with us since day one, you know, they're excited for us naturally too. And because we're very kind, you know, we do these random acts of kindness on our Facebook page where we'll read a story and it'll touch us. So we'll send a series of, of books out or we'll invite that person on our next P&O yeah. cruise or yeah. we'll fly them to the Sunshine Coast for a weekend away or we'll, you know, to stand out in Frankfurt, we went to the Sunshine Coast City Council and we said, we think you need to... Uh, put together a really beautiful trip for two people in Germany to the Sunshine Coast and they're going, well, okay. But that was $10,000 worth of trip mm. that they put together mm. to help us stand out from the person next to us that didn't have that for, for German, you mm. know, visitors mm. to that fair. Mm. So, you know, it's exciting. I love collaborations. That's mm. one core part of my business that I do strategically mm. and, and well. Mm. But you've got this fierce resolve, ferocious resolve, yet no hubris, is there? Oh, I'm very grounded. Yeah. Yeah, I'm too busy. I'm too busy for all of that. Right. Yeah, it's just, you know, and in such a busy world, in such a busy world with such a great business, with so many fabulous opportunities, you know, the thing I aim to be best mm. at mm. above all is mummy. You know, that's the thing that I want to be best mm. of. And I find to be a good mummy, you have to be present. 
It's a bit like making a marriage work. You must be present. So, you know, that's why we continue to foster our online conversations. And, you know, do I travel? Yes. Do I do it when it suits my family? Mm. Absolutely. Often my family will come with me. Mm -hmm. You know, I've just booked a a week uh, to to Young, actually, for the Cherry Festival. I'm going to Young for the Cherry Festival. But again, you know, I'm a big supporter of independent retailers, of Aussie farmers, huge Mm. supporter Mm. of them just naturally from my background. background, You know, so, um, Mm. you know, I will travel to Young to have harvest the cherries because I'm naturally interested in, mm. in how their season's gone. How mm. has the, the colder, you know, longer, colder winter fared with cherries this mm. year? Mm. Cucumbers. I spoke to a cucumber grower yesterday in Bundaberg. Okay. This cucumber, look him up online, Eden Farms. Do you know how many cucumbers he picked at Eden Farms yesterday? 80,000. Finally, drop the microphone. I'm like, 80,000. And you know the other extraordinary fact? They pick it, mm. they cry, you know how they come wrapped, cry back? They wrap it, they freight it, and it will be, they'll pick it yesterday, and it's for sale in Queensland supermarkets today, New South Wales and Victoria tomorrow. So don't you find that extraordinary? I learned this, I do a, um, I host a radio show, not that I wanted to do it, because I mean, I didn't have time for it, mm. with 2UE in Sydney every day, Monday to Thursday, um, you know, called Talking Lifestyle, and we mm. talk food. Mm. And uh, yesterday, after a few champagnes on Melbourne Cup, I was thinking cucumbers, because we all woke up and put cucumbers on our eyes, because they have hydrating properties. And I went, oh, look, there's so many uses for cucumbers. And then when I'm talking to my girlfriends, and they're going, yeah, I love it in my gin and tonic with orange and cucumber, and then, you know, it's a hydrating, it's an anti-aging. Then we were talking about all these recipes, so then I said, let's get a cucumber farmer on, and we learn all these extraordinary facts about cucumbers. Like, if you have a, a squeaky, you know, door hinge, rub cucumber on it. Really? <laughs> See, these are the you facts you learn this, when you hang you? out with me. If there are but any I found other... that interesting. I might just put that in a book one day. If there are any other questions about cucumbers, we'll take them <laughs> after the break. No, not now. So, uh... are there any questions from the audience? Oh, that's exciting. Because one thing, while I'm just waiting for a question, if you... As an award-winning business leader, what, what advice can you offer? Now, you've got a, a number of people here, emerging business people, entrepreneurs, particularly, particularly uh, female entrepreneurs in the audience tonight. What, what, what advice can you offer? I, now, I think there's a range it. of learnings already. Right. I will demonstrate yeah. it. I'm sitting up here with three books. So uh, this is the Cook for a Cure book that I wrote for to you know, raise awareness for mm. breast cancer, mm. and it's a yeah. really pretty practical book. Yep. Uh, this is a book that I wrote called Healthy Diet, which segregates foods into a traffic light. So red, don't eat, amber, eat off occasionally, green, eat as much as you like. Really quite logical. Think of this as you know, every time you eat something, it's going to nourish you. This is menu planning, because from a finance background, when I learned that $25 worth of gro- every... 100 spent in a grocery store is thrown in the in the in the garbage i went oh my god mm. what are we doing we are failing to plan in our kitchen so i wrote menu planning for that segregated it into days you know easy freezy monday etc who would like these books would anyone like these books I would too, because I'm a little biased, but they are really good, and they're going to help you save time and money in the kitchen. Okay, so when you want something, and they're just here, what have you got to do to get them? Ask, yeah, ask, yep, no, but what else have you got to do? When you really want something, when they're just here in front of you, what have you got to do to get them? You've got to use your manners, yes, yes you do, but you first and foremost got to get up off your ass, and you've got to come down. So I have three books. I have one person up here. Which would you like? There you go. I have two more up here. Who would like one? Yes, that lovely (laughs) lady in the green. I can see her itching. Okay. There is point in case. Yes, you can have the planning one. You're very welcome. My point... (laughs) ..is that if you are sitting there and you have a a desire to do something, you know, if you have an idea like I did that I thought would help me, or if you have a child that has that, or a grandchild, or someone in your care, encourage them. And then, if it is you, my advice is just do. Not like Nike, just do it, because when you're self-employed, there's too many it's, just do it's, just do. Do. Just get up and take action and it will just snowball. It's only stagnation that prevents activity. You know, you just need 
to do, to do. and you will be That's amazed. Right. We really do live in the lucky country. We are so blessed here and mm. the opportunities, mm. if you're willing to work hard, if you can, you know, sort of navigate your way, if you can get good, clever people around you, it really mm. is the sky is I your limit. The flow. Questions? Any of Kim? Any questions from the audience? Yes, over here. Yeah. We'll just get the microphone to you if we could. Here we come. Thanks. Hi. I'm just wondering if you have a favourite book in all the books that you've written and why. Ah, okay, so 28 titles, uh, cumulatively 9 million sales now across uh, all continents. There is one book that is probably my go-to, and I wrote it. What is the one job that gives you the heebie-jeebies in the kitchen? Washing up, dishes, totally, me too. I go to all this trouble to write a book, then I look behind and go, oh my God, who made all that mess? Oh, it's me, I'm the only one here. So one day, I sat down with a very large glass of red wine, and uh, I wrote a cookbook um, where I was concentrating on minimising the clean-up after the cook-up. And every recipe in this book, breakfast, lunch, dinner, dessert, you can make... <laughs> See? How clever is she? Oh, she's just fantastic. You can make dirtying one pot or one bowl. And that's what I called it. Four ingredients, one pot and one bowl. And I thought women like me, you know, the busy mums at the end of the day just got five minutes to get things. I don't, you know, I'm not like Jamie. I don't have 30 minutes. I've got five minutes and I'm in a hurry. So, you know, would love it. And they have. But guess who have been my biggest online buyers of this book? Men. God bless your cotton picking socks, boys. Men, I couldn't believe it. So whether it's just what you want to put four things, oh, here's Michael, who's, you know, a famous restaurateur in your part of the woods. He's probably put 600 things in a pottle bowl. But we're happy to pay $40 for that experience. But, you know, at home on a Wednesday night, you know, you just want something, a satay chicken where you get a tablespoon of red curry paste, saute it off in your one frying pan, add to it your protein. So I might do chicken, mm -hmm. chop, chop, chop. And then, you know, saute three, four minutes, add two tablespoons of peanut butter. Why do we love that? How many people here have got peanut butter at home? 90% of you. And then bring it all together with some cream. Now, if you're low-fat, no-fat, skim trim, you use whatever, but I use full-fat cream for my cooking. So, you know, there's the, the world's easiest, tastiest chicken satay, and you've dirtied one frying pan. So, look, Kim has... The books are out here for sale. Kim's going to... Sign the books for you. But because that lovely was so lovely lady was so proactive and put her hand up, guess what? You just won yourself a copy of. There you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> participation, participation. <laughs> You're very welcome. You're very now welcome. Now that's going to generate about 44 other questions. Ah, uh, oh, I know. There you go. Any other questions? Yes, right here. Just quickly with the microphone. Sorry. Here we go. <laughs> I know, I don't know. And do you know what? The other day in Caloundra on uh, Melbourne Cup, someone said to me at the start of the day I was interviewed and the question they asked me is, what are you backing today? And I said, $5 each way on every local horse, number four. Mm. Do you know how many, t six races, do you know how many times number four won? <laughs> Three. <laughs> <laughs> But don't you find that extraordinary? <laughs> I don't know. It's just such That's an... That's amazing. Yeah. You know, probably if you were living in Asia, four's not such a lucky number, but for me, it's been exceptionally lucky. So I don't know. It just seems to be how we roll. Yeah. This has been great. Is there one final question? Right here. Yeah. Just one second. Here we go. I'll oh, Anna from NAB. Can you hear yeah. up the back? Could you please, just in the microphone, here we go. There you go. The I just wanted to, first of all, congratulate you, but also ask you how present is your husband in your business these days, or is it just you and your lovely other ladies? No, no, no. So there's the four girls, um, you know, that work in my business. My husband is also, he's my business partner. People say to me, how do you go working with your husband? But honestly, there is no one that looks after your business better than your spouse. You're on the same path. You're on the same trajectory. <coughs> and, you know, in our business, there's, what, 16 computers, laptops, airs. What, there's always problems, and it's just wonderful to have that operations person to go, can you fix that problem, please? Can you help me, please? You know, and not only have do we have, like, um, 
when you write so many cookbooks and you, you know, still essentially I'm self-published in Australia, um, I don't just order 30 copies, I'll order pallet loads. Mm -hmm. So on the Sunshine Coast um, at Moffat Beach, we have a company now called Storage for You. So we said uh, we have many things now that we have mm -hmm. built as an offshoot to um, needs from generated from our own so he looks after all of that as well but oh my god Anna he is just my rock he is so fantastic and he just gets it and he's he knows how hard I work though as well you know he sees it I sit up every night you know I'm never in bed hardly before midnight not because it's just I don't know it's quiet mm. I find mm. that time yeah I've got space to think the phone's not ringing as much northern hemisphere comes online but there's a period between north and mm. south where it's quiet mm. and you can just I don't know so so he Kim it. from here just final question just what does the future hold? What's your, what's your growth strategy from here? What is, it, what is it that really, again, excites you about the future? Okay, well, two, two parts. We've just mm. spent five days in Frankfurt and um, our aim there was to sell foreign rights. So mm. foreign rights into, because mm. it doesn't matter where you live, the whole world is busy. Mm. And most of the world loves a good, easy chicken satay. So, you know, and especially, you know, the, the ingredients are often, because it is so simple, the ingredients are easily transferable. Not very many of my recipes require Vegemite or ingredients, you know, mm. esoterically Australian. Most mm. are eggs, lettuce, cucumber, whatever, you know, so it's mm. easily transferable. So foreign rights, we want to expand internationally with our backlist. Um, also, uh, I have now become, you know, a creator of content. Mm. And I don't believe that content is king for a second. Content clutters when it isn't useful. When it's useful, content is king. So I have a lot of useful content. So, you know, um, there are photo libraries uh, now called Shutterstock, things like that. Mm. I want to actually uh, build the world's biggest um, food Shutterstock. So that's one thing that I have. Mm. My next title as well, and this is a world exclusive, lucky you're all here today. I was at the IGA annual expo uh, on the Gold Coast mm. in July, mm. and there was in the heart of it all a huge big auditorium, uh, the company Purina, mm. Purina Pet Foods. Yeah? And on this, it was all black, and on this there was one sentence, and it was again numbers. I'm driven by numbers. I get best ideas for my books from numbers. The, the, the one sentence read, there are 4.4 million domestic dogs in Australia. Well, I could not get back to our stand fast enough because I'm saying, girls, guess what? We're writing. And they're going, what are we writing? And I said, our next book is the first humanised cookbook for pets. So it's going to be allergy aware. It's going to be something you could serve your kids, although, you know, they may not eat it. <laughs> Uh, no satay in this book, but it's really, and it is, and you know what, we've just trademarked, we've, you know how like a human will eat a meatloaf, guess what it's called in my pet book, muttloaf. <laughs> you heard it here first, beautiful people, and you know what, I have visions, one day you'll be able to go into IGA, because I've lobbied to work with IGA for three years. I love their independent ethos in our, in our communities. So I signed a two-year deal with them earlier this year uh, that I think will go on for a long, long time. So clever collaborations mm -hmm. domestically, mm -hmm. uh, cookbooks that continue to... Um, I want to pioneer. I want to, I want to be the leader. You know, why has four ingredients stood the test of time? Because we've forged, we've led, we haven't... There are so many other four ingredients cookbooks on the market now, but I feel confident that we've always been able to sort of, you know, stay ahead of the curveball mm -hmm. because we are our market. We know mm -hmm. the problems you're having because guess what? We're having them too. And what about so, the US? Pretty uncharted market for you. Yeah, US, internationally, that's just a whole... Like, we're in Singapore next week um, at a, a, an event called Story Drive Asia, and it's really mm. a, an event for content providers. Okay. And it's content okay. for all sorts of streams, short-form mm. video, long-form mm. video, um, magazine, print, you know, mm. hard paper, mm. but that's from buyers from the States. From mm. So we need to move more in these spheres, mm. in these circles, to get so, the brand mm. and the success of the brand here known internationally but that's mm. something that you know watch this space we will talk again you know in a couple of years and a lot I think will have happened between now and then it's very exciting ladies and gentlemen please thank Kim McCoy thank you
Well, <laughs> well, let's just go and have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> well, Kim, uh, thanks very much for a wonderful uh, interview and um, wonderful insights. It was just uh, I inspiring. Um, but I thought, just making some notes, and I could make plenty, but I thought yours is such a really modern story. Um, and I say, well, from farm to finance to food. Intricately linked. Exactly. And this is very Gen Y and Gen Z. You know, this is, mm. this is the modern world. Mm. Uh, so that was the first thought I had. And clearly you've inspired everybody here by your energy, your passion, your self-belief. Um, and I think uh, your brilliant flair for marketing, uh, that's extraordinary. But I have to say, you know, you just have this wonderful touch of Hollywood. Oh, and, really? Yeah, yeah. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. God bless and you, Peter Little. We're all <laughs> we're all selling, and I'm trying to yep. sell. I'm trying to sell a conclusion. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I was looking to you, and I thought you just remind me of the energy and theatricality of Steve Irwin. Another, an amazing world-class phenomenon. Um, so that struck me. But from the entrepreneurial point of view, one of the things that, uh, you know, and Ray and I talk about this a lot, and we study entrepreneurs, and, and we've been associated with a lot, and I say, one thing that entrepreneurs have that others don't is they see what others don't. Mm. And you saw easy. And uh, that's amazing, you know, you saw easy. And it, it seems so easy, but of course, you saw it and others didn't. Um, and importantly, uh, you changed the game. Uh, you won the market for fast livers, and that's all of us. Mm -hmm. um, and that's in all of us. So, ladies and gentlemen, please thank Kim for an, an amazing and wonderfully inspiring presentation. As part of Kim's uh, appearance here tonight, she has uh, enabled the State Library to donate part of her appearance fee to the National Breast Cancer Foundation. Um, and for those of you who would like to uh, revisit the conversation or share it with friends, and I'm sure everybody will, and I can tell you, my daughter, who is a real foodie and is into your genre, she's watching in Melbourne tonight. Hi, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> The webcast and transcript will be available on the SLQ website within about a week, so please recommend it to your friends. Uh, tonight, a very special thanks uh, to Ray Weeks for um, uh, a wonderful participation, but I have to say, Ray, <laughs> this is the first time where, in all the years we've been working together, where you weren't necessary. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> That's right. That's true. Oh. Yes, he was. It was very necessary. <laughs> but for all the other occasions this year where you were necessary <laughs> and did a brilliant job, thank you. No, thanks. <laughs> and by the way, please give him a big hand for a happy birthday, Ray. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy birthday. It's a tea towel. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Have you seen the, this tea towel? How good is this? Huh? Uh, is that good? I I'm, know. I'm prepared to auction this for breast cancer. <laughs> right. You only need a small one because you'll be only using it on one pot. That's, right. That's all you need, Mr. Little. Thank you. See, more brand ambassadors. How fabulous. <laughs> I'd Thanks. like to thank you all for coming tonight and, and for your uh, support for the Game Changers throughout 2016. We're presently working on uh, the 2017 program and it will be wonderful again, I can assure you. We'd like to invite you to join us on the Queensland Terrace for refreshments, uh, but in doing so, I'd like to thank Crow Horworth, uh, Channel 7, Morgans, NAB, uh, Logan City Council and the RACQ and our generous refreshment sponsors, Cloverly Estate and the Newstead Brewing Company. And please take time uh, to buy some books, 
which Kim will happily sign, and to get to know somebody you haven't met before. Thank you all for being here. We look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you. <laughs>